Welcome to the first episode of the second season of Meet the Podcasters, the show where I sit down and talk to successful podcast hosts about their craft. My guest today is Chris Williamson, host of Modern Wisdom, and as you'll hear in this conversation, Chris is the first ever repeat guest we've had on this show. Of all the episodes I recorded for the first season, Chris has ended up being the most popular by a considerable margin, so I was really glad to have him back on to catch up about what he's been up to since then. For those that don't know, Modern Wisdom is a podcast that helps listeners understand more about themselves and the world around them through conversations with some of the most interesting humans on the planet. From fitness tips to relationship advice to astronomy and biotechnology, it's impossible to pigeonhole the show into one particular niche, but I think that's part of what makes it so successful. Over the past year and a half, the show has genuinely exploded in popularity, and I'm not just exaggerating for effect. It's gone through a legitimate 10x growth period. When I recorded the first conversation with Chris, he had around 20K subscribers on his YouTube channel. And at the time of this recording now, he has 215K. So he's obviously getting something right. Not only is Chris naturally talented at what he does, as you'll hear, he's also very serious about doing everything he can to continually improve and get better as a podcaster. So if you're interested in building your own audience, I think you'll get a lot out of this conversation. Personally, I really enjoyed recording this one. It's always a pleasure chatting with Chris. So I hope you find it as useful, entertaining, and insightful as I did. In this episode, we discuss how the pandemic ended up benefiting many content creators, the role genetics plays in becoming a successful podcaster, why Chris adopts an athlete's mindset when it comes to podcasting, tips and advice for preparing for interviews and asking better questions, how developing your skill as an interviewer can benefit you in your everyday life, strategies and resources for growing your show on YouTube, Chris's current audio and video equipment setup, how to create and grow a newsletter for your podcast, Chris's experience interviewing best-selling author and psychologist Jordan Peterson, and many other topics as well. As always, you can find links to everything we mentioned in this episode, including Chris's equipment setup in the show notes on the podcast.co website. The link is in the description if you'd like to head there and check those out. But for now, let's get into the conversation. Today, I'm joined by Chris Williamson, host of Modern Wisdom and the first ever repeat guest on this show. So welcome back, Chris. It's a great honor to be here. Thanks, mate. So I had a look back when we recorded the first conversation and it was January 2020. And that was just as the pandemic was kind of beginning to kick off. We didn't know what was in store for us, what was coming down the pipeline. But at that point, things had really started to take off from Modern Wisdom. You said in that episode, you had done more plays in December 2019 than all of 2018 combined, and your growth really has followed like this hockey stick shaped curve since that point. The podcast has become much bigger. You've given a TEDx talk. You achieved one of your big personal goals by having Jordan Peterson on as a guest. You rebranded your YouTube channel and you started publishing more solo content. So it really has been, you know, kind of amazing and inspiring to see what you've managed to build. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation as an opportunity to unpack and explore all the work that went on behind the scenes to make Modern Wisdom what it is today. But before we get into that, you know, how has the last year and a half been for you? So I'm a club promoter, which means that pandemics aren't our best friend, not being a whole lot of nightlife going on for the last 16 months. Uh, but anyone that's a content creator has benefited massively from the last year. Like the single best thing that could have happened to the content creation industry was a pandemic. Now we don't want the homeless people and the economy down the pipe and everyone dying, but the views are up. So, you know, it's been a <laughs> giveth and taketh away with different hands. So yeah, man, I mean, I went, I moved to three a week, three episodes a week, which was a, a quite an aggressive schedule. But when you can't leave your house other than to go to Asda every couple of days, put the graft in and it seemed to pay dividends. Yeah, and uh, just we mentioned previously, just before we started recording, that you had uh, injured your Achilles and uh, you had to kind of adapt and improvise and overcome with your podcast setup. Yeah, I created um, a, a horizontal, horizontal sort of reclined podcast setup that must have been quite bizarre for the guests actually to to see because I was like, it was like they were sat on my crotch and I was <laughs> recording to them there, which was disturbing, disturbing for many of them, I'm sure. 
anything to get the content. You know, you got to get the free episodes. Clicks a week. clicks, like, man. You, clicks a clicks. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, as I was saying, like, um, you know, we that's something we noticed during the pandemic, like the web traffic to podcast.co just kind of doubled overnight, not because of anything that we'd done or because us and the marketing team had done a particularly good job. We just got lucky. And obviously lots of people were, you know, looking for a creative outlet and looking to start podcasts. You know, that's we're beginning to see that tail off again now as people go back to work and they're not as interested or they're not, you know, able to, to keep up their podcast or whatever. But, you know, as you say, a kind of blessing in disguise. Um, so one of the things that I want to make clear up front here uh, after the monologue that I've just given is kind of modern wisdom is not this overnight success story. I think like your work rate, your discipline, your dedication to podcasting over the past three or four years is something which really separates you from a lot of other content creators out there. Um, so just on that note, like what should people understand about the workload that's associated with what you do? Because from the outside looking in, there's a tendency to think, well, that's easy. And, you know, I could do it if I just sat down and, and, you know, gave it enough time. I got this stat a little while ago. I don't know whether you guys have seen this as well, but 90% of podcasts don't make it past episode three. And then of the 10% that do, 90% of those don't make it past episode 20. I can't remember Hmm. where I got this industry stat from, but that literally means that by making episode 21, you're in the top 1% of all podcasters ever. And it just highlights that consistency is a really rare thing in this world. Yeah, I mean, it's graft. Like it's, I'm a grafter. Like I I always have been. And the background that I come from in club promo has really sort of instilled that into me. And then maybe you port over to content creating and, and maybe that's a competitive advantage. I don't know. Um, but I mean, it might look fun. Like you just watch an episode between you and a guest and it it goes well or whatever. And you get Jordan Peterson on and you have a chat about life and meaning or whatever. But, you know, to get to that stage where you can actually send the email that gets replied to, there's 320 episodes, all of which have needed outreach, research, scheduling, recording, editing, more editing, promo on the back end, conversations between you and the the videographer. Oh, I don't like that thumbnail. Oh, what's the title going to be? Oh, what, I'm away. I don't have the internet, whatever it might be. 300 and now 360 times, like over mm. and over and over and over again. Um, I think people probably get disheartened with podcasting because the sort of growth that you can get on a more algorithmically manipulated platform like YouTube or perhaps Instagram or Twitter to a slightly lesser extent, but specifically on YouTube, you know, you can have people that start accounts, do one video that goes hyper viral, and then you've got 100k subs and that's your channel. Sweet. No one has that with podcasting. Maybe some people come in and they've got like a huge social media following, like a James Smith, for instance, a buddy of mine from the UK, he's got this monster of an email list with like half a million people on it and he's just a traffic weapon so he just mm. directs people around the internet as he needs but unless you're him you it's going to take like 150 episodes before you have a non-embarrassing audience probably like if you're just a normal person and i had a bit more of a head start i had a bit of a social media following so i could drive some traffic there um but yeah it's graft man and I I took the opportunity. I read a a book called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield last year. And in it, he has a a chapter called Turning Pro. And he just talks Mm. about the differences between an amateur and a professional. And a professional turns up to work when he doesn't feel like it. And a professional covers all of the bases. A professional makes sure that he is doing everything he can to be all that he can be. All this sort of stuff. And it really resonated with me because I realized I wasn't being a professional with the show. I wanted professionals' outcomes without mm. having to put professional inputs and efforts in. And um, yeah, that reading that and realizing, right, okay, like, do you, want, do you want to try and become one of the best in your industry at doing this? If you do, treat it like that. You don't see Olympians like dicking about and missing half of their training sessions <laughs> or not getting enough sleep or not sorting their nutrition out. Like they take it seriously because they're professionals. So mm. yeah, that was, the, that was the pivot that I made last year. Yeah, nice. Like you mentioned, obviously, all the work that goes into the back end, like your conversations with your editors and all the production stuff. Like, I definitely want to get into that kind of side of things later on in the conversation. Um, but 
One of the things you touched on there now in terms of the analogy comparing podcasting to Olympians, this is something that I was actually thinking of, you know, last night, this morning. I was listening to your most recent episode with the psychologist Robert Plowman, which I thought was brilliant, very good episode. And it got me thinking about genetics as it relates to podcasting. Um, so, uh, you know, the one thing I would say is like, you know, the talent you have or the ability you have to do what you do on your show is is quite rare. You know, there aren't many people in the world who can do what you do and be so successful of it. And to, to kind of bring it back to this Olympic analogy, you know, everyone can get involved in sport. Everyone can get involved in podcasting and you can take it as far as you can take it if you keep going. But it's always going to be the genetic outliers who rise to the top and win an Olympic gold medal or build a very big audience. You know, we just talked about hard work and it is graft, but that's not the be all and end all. Um, so I'd just be interested to hear, you know, your thoughts on that and how you think about that aspect of podcasting. Really good insight, man. Yeah, I am. Um, I think that, to be honest, more people are inconsistent than are talented or enthusiastic. So if, if you were to give me a blend of skills for a podcaster to have, like the number one skill that they would have would be consistency ahead of talent. Um, because there's far more talented people that try their hand at podcasting and don't make it. That being said, yeah, I, I appreciate your uh, kind words. You you do have to put up with being called a gobshite when you're a kid in order to be a competent <laughs> podcaster when you're an adult, apparently. But yeah, I don't know, man. Like it just, things come naturally to me like this. And Rogan says the same. He talks about how he doesn't really overthink it. Like he just, he just does his thing. And, and if it appears to work, it appears to work. And so far, whatever the formula is, is working. But even that, man, like I go back, I go back to episodes from one year ago and I cringe. I'm like, this is so bad. What are you talking about? What's that <laughs> intro? Why are you doing that? Why are you saying this? You didn't need to say that. And it just constantly, I'm constantly improving. And that's the thing that encourages me. So every single episode that I do, my process becomes better. My diction becomes better. I mean, one thing that I've done to do my TEDx talk, I hired a speech coach um, to to coach me for my TEDx talk, but he specializes in theater and diction. So his speciality is in uh, precision with the spoken word. So I've been mm. working with him all of this year, um, maybe 10 to 20 sessions, 10 to 15 sessions or so since the beginning of the year. And that was the thing, like that's turning pro, you know? Like mm. that literally raised whatever genetic predisposition I had to be able to talk a lot. He came in and honed that, right? Look, mm. you're, you're not clipping your consonants enough. You're dropping your T's. You're, you have a slight lisp. It turned out that I had a slight lisp. So I've been doing these very particular like S routines on my morning walk. But that's the thing. I was like, that feels like what a professional would do. And mm. I don't know. I would be really interested to hear if anybody knows of anyone in the podcast world or in the content creation world that really talks about honing their craft to the degree that an Olympian does, you know, if this is the thing that you're going to do, if you really, really want to be great at YouTube or podcasting or whatever it might be, like, are you getting enough sleep? Does your nutrition and your daily routine facilitate you being at peak performance when you need to be? Have you got a coach? Have you got multiple coaches? Have you, are you working on all of the different elements of your performance? your research, your performance, like the way that you actually present yourself, like all of that stuff. Like, I don't know whether, I don't know whether anyone is. And, and it's kind of cool to think, oh, well, maybe this is something a bit new. Maybe not many people do this. And maybe, maybe it's a complete waste of time. Maybe it doesn't make any impact on my show at all. But then I feel like maybe it probably does. Yeah, it's, it's weird because people immediately understand when you give the context of sport and they're like, well, if you want to win an Olympic gold medal, these are the things you need to do. But suddenly when you move outside that area and it's less, I don't know, pe people just assume that it works differently and, you know, you can kind of phone it in or take it easy and, you know, expect these big results that you, but it's, it's exactly the same. Do you know, like do you know you why I think to... that is? I, I think it's why? because the parameters for success and failure and performance are loosely defined so no one knows if this podcast today with you is better or worse than that podcast yesterday with robert plowman and better than that podcast the day before whereas in sport you have very very tightly defined win lose rules of the game quantifiable metrics of success this was your speed this was your ground covered this was your weight lifted whatever 
and it's a lot more input process output whereas with this it's just this big mess and those degrees of freedom that people have they encourage lazy thinking they encourage lazy performance if you think that you can get away if, if i thought that i could get away with winning the olympics tomorrow in a gold medal whilst only having four hours of sleep i might just go on youtube for for a ton tomorrow night but everybody that's in that sport knows that that's not the way it works whereas because no one can tell if you're a bit underslept on a podcast they might just uh, you kind of sounded a little bit not so good, but I can't really work out why or whatever. Uh, I just think that those degrees of freedom permit people to take things less seriously. Yeah, like I, I hadn't thought of that, but now that you've put that out there, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and like, th like one of the things I just want to be clear about is I'm not here to discourage anyone and you know say that you shouldn't start a podcast because you, you don't have the natural ability. Like, if you're passionate about it, then running a podcast can enrich your life in a lot of ways, even if you don't build this this huge audience. But it's important to look at the reality of the situation for what it is and like understand what it takes to, to get to certain places and understand that you need to put in a certain amount of time if you want to get there. You you mentioned uh, Rogan and you know one of the things that I think there's, there's obviously some similarities between your show and his show and one of the things i wanted to touch on is you know i think both of your shows are like extremely valuable in in a public service kind of way and just let me clarify what i mean by that so one of the things that i studied at university and one of the things i'm interested in is how podcasts can spread scientific research and good information to a really wide audience and i think your show is a good example of that but again it's unique in the podcasting world because most podcasters, like what I'm doing on this show, you have to niche down and cater to one particular audience. And that's generally good advice if you want to carve out, you know, some kind of audience in a saturated market. But niching down makes your podcast much less effective as a vehicle for science communication because you're preaching to the choir in a certain way. Generally, the people who listen to science podcasts are the people with a degree level education, not the people that maybe you know, really need to hear that information. But because you talk about a wide variety of topics on your podcast, it's not just science. It brings all these kind of people in from different backgrounds. They become fans. And if they're tuning into your show, they're going to get regular doses of science and, and quality information. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on podcasting as a vehicle for science communication. And if you've ever thought about, you know, your role and responsibility over the spread of good ideas uh, in, in society. For sure, man. I mean, these people know really fascinating stuff about the world, but they don't have the platform necessarily to be able to communicate it. There are so many interesting ideas out there. And until podcasts, how would you how would you know about this evolutionary psychologist or this new theory around how testosterone affects our early development or this law of behavioral genetics or whatever it might be? Um, but if all that you're doing is hammering away on like, let's say it was all about evolutionary psychology. Yeah, you'd have an awesome audience of evolutionary psychologists, but why would anybody else be interested? They need more of a variety. And the analogy with Rogan is is apt because he he's my sort of intro to the podcasting world. He was the thin end of the wedge. And I think I've very much modeled at least my guest selection, not purposefully on him, but simply that our interests align. I have a broad range of curiosities and I'll speak to anyone from a conspiracy theorist to a philosopher to a porn star like I want to know what all of them have to teach me and I think that every episode has had someone or something other than the ones that I didn't I haven't published um, all of them <laughs> have had something really interesting to tell the audience and it's like yeah maybe maybe every single episode that you listen to isn't bang on for you but it's the same as going into an art gallery, you don't presume that the curator of the art gallery has created an entire experience of all your favorite pieces of art. What you hope is that the person that's curated it is going to expose you to some stuff that you already know and already love and reinforces your beliefs. And then maybe some new stuff that challenges your beliefs. And then maybe some stuff that you've never even heard of before and that you thought, God, I, like, I didn't even know that this existed. And then maybe some of it's not for you, but it overall, you have an experience that you're, you leave and you're like, wow, that's so much, I'm so much more enlightened around this. Uh, and then when it, when it comes to the scientific sort of uh, information, absolutely, I think that there is a responsibility of podcasters to um, put across ideas that they think can make the world a better place. 
Like, no. Otherwise, what are you doing? Like, I mean, if you want to go onto some decentralized alt right or alt left network <laughs> and and talk about like fringe theories constantly, like cool. Like if you want to go and talk about like super authoritarian or super liberal or super whatever, like cool. Like that's 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 your thing. But it would you, you are going to need to convince me a lot harder that that is genuinely making the world a better place. Whereas if mm. you've got you know James Nestor, guy that wrote the book Breath, had him on last mm. week, like fundamental physiological response to needing air like the first mm. thing that's going to kill you if you don't have it and <laughs> you, you can walk away from that episode and think right i really need to work on nasal breathing you just take one takeaway from that or like mm. i haven't had him on yet but matthew walker man like that number 1109 with rogan that he did he he's saved like hundreds or thousands of hours of life from people mm. by them prioritizing their sleep and they mm. might have got exposed to his book or maybe like stumbled across some of his research or whatever, but it's Rogan's job to platform a person that can genuinely make the world a better place. And it's like, yeah, it feels pretty good to do that. Yeah, like these easily accessible tools that like anyone can get a hand of or like just in my own life, when I look at how different my life would be if I hadn't discovered podcasts and I hadn't learned the things that I've learned through you know consuming this content like it's it does make a tangible difference in your life uh and in that sense it is important um you know i heard you say like when you're talking about you modeled your show off you know well not intentionally modeled it off rogan but in terms of your guest selection process it is pretty similar and i've heard you say elsewhere that in relation to starting a podcast you should aim to produce the show that only you as a completely unique individual can produce. This also feeds into the topic of your TEDx talk titled Embracing Your Weirdness. So could you talk about what it means to embrace your weirdness and you know, how that would relate to starting a podcast? Yeah, so that talk was aimed at a large majority of people that I think round off unique or quirky elements of their personality in the hopes that it's going to make them be more accepted by society at large. They think it's going to make them more competitive in the workplace or more lovable and popular or spiritually just more accepted. And they've got the bar stool upside down that all of the things that they're doing are completely backward, that people don't choose a particular employee because of their similarity to all of the other employees. They choose them because of their unique talents. No one can beat you at being you. Your competitive advantage is your uniqueness. Uh, the same thing goes for relationships. Like, Nobody has ever fallen in love with someone and the reason being, I just, I'm so turned on by the fact that they've got this sort of vanilla, very <laughs> predictable kind of opinion. I, like, I know one thing out of their mouth and I can accurately extrapolate everything else that they're going to say. No one's ever done that, right? So there's number two. And then number three, like if you spiritually think that you're going to connect more to not being you, why do you think that so many actors end up with mental health problems and committing suicide? It's because... People don't love them. They love the roles that they play. And if you're playing a persona throughout your entire life, any success that you have doesn't resonate with you because you don't feel connected to the things that you're doing. You're always this one degree removed. You have like Chris performing and Chris in real life. And people applaud Chris performing, but Chris in real life has this gap between this buffer zone between the two. So that was the, the topic of the talk. And then, yeah, when it comes to the show, like it, it, we're talking more about competitive advantage here but mm. genuinely your weirdness is the only thing that you have to compete with you're a unique combination of genetic predisposition and and the funny way that you say the letter s the fact that you've got a slight lisp and <laughs> the fact that you're from the north and the fact that you used to be a club promoter or the fact that whatever pick the things that are from your background no one else has that unique combination so utilize it like that's your insight um whereas somebody that tries to be the new lex friedman or tries to be the new joe rogan like at the very, very best, the very, very best thing that you can hope for is being the second best Joe Rogan in the world. <laughs> like, and realistically, it's going to be almost impossible for you to do that because you don't understand all of the things that he understands. You don't have the idiosyncrasies. You're trying to model what someone else does naturally, but you're trying to think it. You're, you're trying to front brain it out. It's just not going to work. So yeah, yeah. I, that was something I always had a problem with it, man. I still do. Like I'm a guy who has very, very varied interests and i've always had a problem with you need to niche down like i get it i from the game theoretic how the algorithm works 
capture an audience, do a thing. Like, I get it. But niching down, it, uh, your niche can be the fact that your audience is so broad and that the topics are so wide. Like, that is also a niche, the fact that no one else has this broad range of guests. So I'm aware it's like a bit circular, but it, it, it seems to have worked. And like, I'm really proud of the show. Like, I, I really, really love, like, I would listen to it. Like, I would subscribe to my own show. And that's it. Like, would you subscribe to your own show? Like, would you listen to it religiously, week in, week out? If so, then that's it. And whatever that is, that's the heuristic. Doesn't If that's, I really love going narrow and deep on Premier League football and the performance and the transfer windows and all that stuff. There you go. That's it. Because you're going to outwork the next person to you because that person's going to be banging their head against the wall on a Friday night thinking, God, I wish I didn't have to talk about fucking Premier League anymore. <laughs> but all that you want to do, all that you would be doing would be down the pub with your mates in any case. So you're like, right, well, come around. I'll grab some beers, set the mics up, crack on. But if the converse is true and you just want to talk about everything, essentially, do that. Like, I, I genuinely think that that's, that's the competitive advantage you have. Yeah, like one of the phrases that I've heard you use elsewhere was like weaponized curiosity. And, uh, you know, that's what you were talking about there. Like figuring out what it is that you would do anyway and what you spend most of your time. Like what are your hobbies and interests? What are the things that you invest a lot of mental energy into? And that's definitely the area that you should kind of go down. I think the the other quote as well, like, and, you know, we've touched on variants of it. Naval Ravikant, you can escape competition through authenticity. You know, I think there are a lot of other things that podcasters can learn from him. Last year, I actually bought the almanac of Naval Ravikant after hearing Eric Jorgensen on your show. Great book. Highly recommend that to anyone listening. I think for content creators particularly, you know, that's a really good book. Uh, And, you know, I was just reading that book thinking, like, the world needs more people like Eric, you know, who are willing to check their ego in in the door and distill down and curate the, you know, really valuable knowledge that other people have put out there. thousand words he went through of transcripts mm. to make that book, man. Like, and look at it now on, it, it, it's approaching, it's good. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if in five years it's the most highlighted book ever on Readwise. Like, I really wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me, like the most highlighted Kindle book in, in history because it's so dense. So yeah, I'm really yeah. glad that you, uh, I'm really glad that you enjoyed that. Yeah, so well organized as well. Um, just a great book. Um, one of the, we've, we've spoken about it already and it's one of the main things that I wanted to talk with you about today is just the art of the podcast interview. Um, because I think you have a lot of value to add there based on what you said in terms of the energy and the time that you're devoting, you know, you're hiring coaches, you're thinking about this stuff constantly. How can I continually improve and not cringe when I listen back? You know, it might be the case that you always cringe when you listen back Mm -hmm. to your old interviews and that's a good thing because it shows that you're continually improving. Uh, but you've said that, you know, to record a truly excellent interview, you need to be able to ride the crest of the now. You know, rather than reading off a big list of of scripted questions. And just to be honest with you, like, I find that terrifying because, you know, I like to be able to prepare and control and have, like, you know, I don't like stepping into the unknown in an interview. And obviously, you do need to do some prep for interviews. You can't just rock up and go, right, we're just going to wing it and, and see what happens. But how do you strike that balance, like, of getting the right amount of prep but also letting the conversation flow naturally? It's a really good question, man. Like this is, for me, the people that are listening that want to go from zero, I don't have a podcast, to 50, I'm now a semi-competent podcaster. Like that's great. There are resources out there. I'm interested in talking to the people that want to go from 90 to 95 or from like 95 to 100. And this is one of the things that I think around about maybe the 80, 80th percentile, like 90th percentile, people really start to dig into this balance between structure and free flow. Um, for me personally, I, I actually think I've probably started to over-prepare um, a little bit too much uh, within the last year. That's been a function of having a lot of people on the show that I don't specifically know what they're talking about. So if I'm introduced to behavioral genetics by Robert Plowman, like the guys studied 20,000 twins in the most clinically de- detailed twins and adoption study in history, and I'm new to the, t- the topic, I, 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 ne- I feel like I need more of a support structure but a lot of the time I get into the show and I'm actually like, nah, like I don't, I don't need that. I don't actually need it. Um, so I'm, I went through, a, a, because it was constant, three episodes a week, most of them 
about books, a lot of those about scientific communication on a huge variety of topics with very little crossover. Um, it, I basically had a lot of the time, like a day and a half to learn an entire body of work. So with that, I, I felt like I needed more of a support structure. I'm actually now dialing that back and I'm purposefully uh, reducing the amount of notes that I take into an episode. And I am just going to find whatever's optimal for me with that. But yeah, I think overall, you know, if you are in, if you're a competent podcaster and you're looking to really sort of double this down, just play around with it. The same way as you might play around with different tactics in a sports game. And I often think of it like this, like no sports team in history has gone out on the field without a, a, some plays in their pocket, but a lot more teams are able to free flow than others. And just because this game today maybe ended up, you know, maybe you didn't perform quite so well, but maybe that's because you tried to stick to a really rigid set of rules and then you learn from it and you're like, okay, that's too much. That's way mm. too much. Like I'm trying to read, read all of these questions off. Or yeah. you do the converse and you're like, I didn't know what I was talking about and I got lost and I floundered around. <laughs> like that's also, that's, that's not enough. And you find your sweet spot between it. Um, my number one piece of advice really, I, I still now, I hate the intro to a podcast. It's always weird always awkward especially if you record a pre-recorded pre-roll so if you do the foreplay for the episode off camera and then you meet the guest and you spend five minutes with them going like hey mate here am i random human from the internet that's going to talk to you about this thing and i need you to be comfortable with me and you try and make some shit jokes or whatever and like get them to like open up a little bit and then you're like three two one robert plowman welcome to the show and then you're in and you're like fuck so i always have the first thing that i say is always uh, written out the first question that i have is almost always written out unless it's a very good friend so if it's a michael malice or if it's a johnny and Yusef, like my, my buddies um i'm sweet i can just say like what are you wearing that for or what have you been doing today or whatever comes to mind but just getting yourself into that um is a good part of conversation craft i would also i think it's a good idea to give the guest room to breathe so and this is something that i've only learned since being a guest on more shows that um have you ever seen someone do a a, a 2k time trial on a ski erg uh, on a, a rowing a, a rowing erg so the way that they actually start the momentum off is they do a bunch of little fast strokes so they like pull 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 like it's like this sort of cadence where they build up to the long ones and i actually think that you know a couple of kind of like dumb back and forth questions and then a big fat one that the guests can sink their teeth into about two minutes in like let them speak, let them stop, let them speak, let them stop, and then just let them go with like, so Robert, let's say that no one's, somebody that's listening has never heard of behavioral genetics before. Like, How do you describe what behavioral genetics is? It doesn't have to be that basic. It can still, it can be something really complex. That's a really like kind of a bit of a cringe, like opener because it's just so obvious, but just give the guest like something because they're nervous as well. And even if they're super confident, they just, you just want to get them into the flow my vocal coach told me about this. You know, you want to get the larynx moving up and down. You want to get their facial muscles moving nicely. And that's when after a little while you can get like bang, 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 bang. Like you can start to move more quickly backward and forward. But you don't want to do that straight off the bat, I don't think. Um, so yeah, that's that's some things, man. Like bit of structure, work out what works for you. Give the guests like something easy to get started on. Maybe have a little bit of a back and forth in the beginning and then just give them room to breathe. And then you can start to come back in and then mm. you can start to have a discussion. That's really good advice. Um, and one of the things that I feel that I've noticed you doing more often, more recently, um, is that you're really considering taking your listeners along for the journey. So you kind of touched on it there, like asking questions that you already know the answers to, but you know that your listeners might not be aware of it and setting the scene and kind of, you know, getting people to stop and define terms or give a concrete example of something. You know, you did that in the episode with Robert. Um, and I think a lot of podcasters, like, they'll, they'll try and go for the big questions, like, the you know, the really to show how much they know about this person or whatever, but that's not always the best for the listener. Um, and it sometimes is good to start from foundations and kind of make sure that you're bringing everyone along from start to finish in the episode. That's the weird thing about a podcast, that it's, it's, it's like somewhere between a conversation and a performance mm. because you want to enjoy it. And if you, don't, if you don't enjoy the episode, then what's the point in doing it? Like genuinely. And this is why I don't like over preparing now because I don't really enjoy it as much. I just want to ask what I'm interested in. 
and hope that the audience comes along. But you are there like you're presenting and performing this conversation for the audience too. So if you understand loads about this topic and jump straight to point five, like, okay, well, no, where's the logical steps that gives people the information that they need? That being said, this is also another important part of having a show that's been around a bit longer. Like, I don't need to define every term anymore. Like Every time that someone brings up Overton Window or Parkinson's Law or Goodhart's Law or Hanlon's Razor or whatever, I don't need to define every single one of those because I know that they've been defined, whatever, for the last 150 episodes since we first brought it up on a Mental Models episode or something like that. So you actually can, you have these sort of cycles within a podcast, but then you have these cycles within the show itself over time, right? Like the beginning of every long running soap opera, they don't reintroduce each individual character because the people that have been watching it for a while, they know the status quo. They understand how this person relates to that person, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's fun, man. Like conversation craft is definitely something that I've spent a lot more time thinking about and the final thing on that like the, the main thing that i've learned over the last year is to shut my mouth mm. like to just be comfortable with silence and that was something that i really struggled with i think we may have brought this up on the first one that we did as well but even more so now um i've done a couple of episodes with a guy called daniel schmachtenberger who's this like pure galaxy brain polymath genius and he regularly takes 30 second breaks in between saying a thing or in between hearing a question and responding. And I love it. Like I love sitting with that silence. I think it adds so much to an episode. Obviously it doesn't work for, if you're having a, a lads chat about the premier league, it's, you know, 30 <laughs> second breaks probably doesn't quite fit. But when you're talking about, you know, the complexities of manifesting your innermost self out into the world and how can we improve civilization, stuff like that, like it actually adds quite a lot. And you're like, Oh, this is sort of, it's sort of dramatic and, and, and deep and and adding all of this performance to it and i really mm. enjoyed that so sitting and learning to just shut up is like it, it's so, it's so easy as well because anyone can do it yeah. like literally anyone can do it just learn to shut your mouth and <laughs> the more that i've shut my mouth in a podcast the better that they've got for sure yeah now this this is interesting because like, it kind of feeds into something that i wanted to touch on in terms of this conversational craft how that bleeds out into you know your life outside the podcast and oh, i think man, you do not want to you do not want to know about that fucking house <laughs> i was in dubai i was in dubai in november last year we fled the lockdown left on the day that the final day that you were allowed to fly out and i went out with george mack so anyone that listens to modern wisdom will know him from the mental models series really smart guy very similar to me just curious individual i'm so used to asking people questions we were at a pool party watching mk dj and it's like classic Dubai crowd, like girls in heels and dresses and lads in oversized T-shirts and like Balenciaga bags and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, separately, both of us had different girl, like girl groups say the same thing to us. One of them said to me, stop podcasting me. And the other <laughs> one said to George, why are you asking me so many questions? Yeah. And it's just obvious that most people aren't that bothered about or that aren't that is interested in what other people have to say. And then, yeah, I've been cursed by what I do recreationally. And it's like now, <laughs> I don't know, it's like it's got its signature stamp on me socially. And I'm having a chat with you. I'm like, oh, so that's that's interesting. So you um, so you work as like this assistant to the CEO, but but your jobs actually you actually do it. So tell me a little bit. OK, that's interesting. So how did you get in? So what about that? And yeah, she's yeah. just like, look, Chris, can you stop podcasting me? <laughs> and I was like, well, like, I don't know, like. I'm I'm really surprised, like, I because I I don't know, like I have a lot less experience at it than you, but I've done a, a bit of podcasting, and like I I I've never had that reaction where people said stop podcast. People don't know me as a podcaster, but I find like people generally tend to like it when you just take an active interest in them and so ask you, questions. And also the key thing, would. the key thing is like to you'll notice that in conversations you're constantly, or usually if you're not aware of it, trying to volunteer information about yourself or what you've done. And if you just put the brakes on that and think like, I don't need to continually talk about myself and the stuff that I've done and just maybe ask them questions. I know if they ask me a question directly about my own experience, then I can answer it. Um, but yeah, it's I'm surprised that you've got that reaction. I actually think that that was a Dubai thing. Like I've <laughs> never had it. I've never had it anywhere else. I just think perhaps Dubai <laughs> is um, particularly self-interested, which might not be too far off the mark. And uh 
But it was like she, the girl that said it to me said it in jest. And the guy that said it to George also kind of said it in jest. But even if it, even if they were completely fine with it, and even if they were enjoying it, it stood out enough for them to notice that something was going on. Mm. Like, why are you asking so many questions? And he's like, mm. well, because I'm interested in what you're doing. Like, fucking sue me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. We'll, we'll leave Dubai on the table and, you know, we might return, but it Sorry, is Dubai. a different world out there. Meet the Podcasters is brought to you by Matchmaker.fm, the largest online platform connecting podcasters with great guests. Whether you're looking for a qualified expert to feature in your next episode, or you'd like to get booked as a guest yourself, you can sign up today for free. Simply create your profile and get instant access to a growing database of more than 40,000 hosts, producers, and subject matter experts from around the world. You can filter profiles by category, location, and language spoken to quickly pinpoint the right guests and shows. And if you need help promoting your own episodes, you can find lists of other podcasters open to ad swaps and cross promotions. Join the community, record better content, and reach a wider audience. Try it out today by heading to matchmaker.fm or clicking the link in the description. And now, let's get back to the episode. I do just want to get into some of the nuts and bolts and technical production stuff kind of before we wrap up today. Um, so since we last spoke, I know you've expanded your team. You've still got video guy Dean helping out with all the editing and post-production work. But I also noticed you were looking to hire an assistant as well. So have you found someone for that role and kind of how is that going? Yep. Assistant Ben has been working for three months or so now. Ben's primary role at the moment is helping me kind of move from the old systems that we had to the new one. So he's doing extra stuff rather than taking workload off my plate so far. But that being said, he's also doing some extra stuff that's really, really fundamental, like providing timestamps and the YouTube versions of the episodes. So he goes through in YouTube studio on the morning that each episode goes up and gets uploaded by Dean. Uh, ben will go in, listen to it at two times speed, submit to me just on WhatsApp. Here's the, the timestamps I'm thinking of. If I've got any amends, I'll tell him. And then he'll put them in and they're ready to go as soon as the episode's uploaded. That would have never got done. Tons of people were asking for timestamps, loads of comments. Look, I really, really need to have timestamps on this episode. And I think because Lex Friedman um, is so big on YouTube and has such a, a crossover with my audience and he's very good with his timestamps, I think that he's kind of set the tone now that timestamps are, are sort of an accepted way to put podcasts on YouTube. Um, so that's been really good. The team and the workflow hasn't really changed, man. Like I'm still recording on uh, Ecamm Skype call recorder. I'm still using Skype for everything. Um, I'm still using this same embarrassing, like really bodged together set of presets on GarageBand. It makes the sound come out nice, but if any sound designer was able to see what I'm actually doing to it, they'd be embarrassed. Uh, I'm still using Orphonic to master everything and pull that out. Um, we upgraded the camera and the audio uh, and pretty much the lighting and everything last year. So a quick run through of that includes um, a Sony a6400 with a dummy battery. So it just runs off the mains, a Sigma 16 mil F1.4 lens, a Godox 150 watt big softbox on my left, a small LED fill that we used to use uh, as one of the key lights previously on my right. Um, a Shure SM7B into a cloud lifter into an Audien ID14. So that's like a very standard setup for anybody in the UK. Um, then a couple of IKEA lights in the background as sort of these mood lights at the back. Those are the tungsten color, which is this really nice sort of copper. Nice. Um, then a vertical bookcase in the other corner, and that's got a Philips Hue strip up the back of it that creates this quite sort of nice glow that comes out the back, and you can change the color or you can keep it set at one thing. And then a, a, a hair light, which is a an Ikea reading lamp, <laughs> um, which is like a gooseneck thing that just provides this little bit of separation from the background. And we spent, bro, I got like fully obsessed this time last year. Oh, am I going to get a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K? Oh, are we gonna, are we going to have this, this, and this? And we just went for like the most widely accepted setup, SM7B with a cloud lifter and a good USB interface and a, an A6400 with a Sigma 16 mil lens. Like it's just really nice, really sharp, nice depth of field. The camera's only there so I can reach out and touch it. So it's all compact. It's within the um, footprint of my desk. And yeah, that's it. Now the output, uh, we got Dropbox Pro, we upgraded to that. That was really mm. cool. 
like super useful because it's got a, a transfer function now so you can just send big files straight off an SD card. So Dean will just receive on an evening time, he'll just receive everything bundled to him in one go. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the, the, the workflow now is, it probably could be better. Like we probably could get, I don't know, I could optimize and go on Zoom or do something else, but like it just works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really reliable. Yeah, thanks for running through. Like we'll drop all the links to, you know, the stuff that you just ran through there uh, in the episode show notes on the website. So if people do want to go there, we will have some technical people listening. Given the nature of the show, if you want to kind of check our Chris's setup, you can find the links on the website. Um, the, the other element and something that's come up for other people um, when we recorded episodes with him it, and, you know, for yourself as well is the importance the podcasters now need to put on publishing to YouTube because as you said, YouTube has this virality that podcasting doesn't have. You know, basically, if you want to grow an audience and you're serious about podcasting, it is becoming essential. It's kind of like a non-negotiable at this point. So with that in mind, you know, what are just some things that podcasters should know about the YouTube algorithm as it relates to thumbnails and frequency of publishing and that kind of thing? Uh, two courses that I've taken over the last year that I thought were really good. Um, uh, 30 Days to a Better YouTube Channel by video creators uh that's like 180 dollars and it's really good really goes in depth into the algorithm the nuts and bolts of that it's not very good in terms of teaching you how to create content but if you're wanting to sort of algorithmically optimize that's good and then my buddy ali abdal his part-time youtuber academy that does everything that that misses off that's significantly more expensive it's a couple of grand but again, it's a cohort-based course. Mm. There's a lot of support in there. So if you're getting serious about wanting to understand YouTube, um, the 30 Days to a Better YouTube channel is a great place to start. And then Ali's course as well is uh, is really good. And, and you can probably email them and, and ask if you can see what they do if, if you're a little bit concerned about how much it costs. Um, Clips has been a huge driver of traffic for me since we last spoke. So um, taking the best sections, especially with big name guests, and then just repurposing them out on the channel. Hmm. Uh, I've chosen so far not to create a separate ch clips channel. What I, I understand that Rogan and Lex and some other podcasts choose to do it in a different way. But from what I've seen with people who have platforms, probably about under half a mil up to a mil is that you reduce the growth of your main channel and end up with a fairly lame second channel that no one really cares about mm. like you need to have an awesome podcast for people to subscribe to the second channel of your podcast <laughs> like if you're still making your name on the first one I, I i don't think that bifurcating the content makes a lot of sense plus you can feed the algorithm quite nicely let's say you're publishing once a week but you manage to get a clip or a couple of clips out per episode like that's good mm. there you go that's three episodes a week or three videos a week um, in terms of optimizing algorithmically, we, we did a rebrand. We did a big rebrand at the beginning of the year when I changed from Modern Wisdom to Chris Williamson on YouTube. Um, that gave us a more consistent thumbnail style, more consistent colorways. Um, we did a lot of work, like hours and hours and hours of obsessing over fonts and stuff like that. And we paid that price once. And now I really love the way that the channel looks. I think that the fonts are nice. It really sort of represents how I want to look on YouTube, at least at the moment. I think we could maybe be a tiny little bit more elegant and sort of, um, yeah, elegance is the right word for it. But for now, I'm really, really happy with it. Uh, clips is a non-negotiable for me. Like if you're going to get a good guest on, let's say that you get a guest who's, you know, 10x your value as a podcaster and you just put an episode out, you're, there is just infinite numbers of ways that you can chop that up mm. into an IGTV, into a reel, into a TikTok. You know, Jordan Peterson said this on the episode with him, man. It stuck with me. It's like, it's the best quote I've ever heard about repurposing. He said, it's like you could write a book and sell it by the sentence. <laughs> That's what doing clips is for your podcast. And you've hit the nail on the head as well. Like for me now, the priority is still to grow the audio because it's the most consistent. I know where it's at. I know where it's going to be at in terms of growth. But YouTube's what's driving it. Mm. Like, YouTube went from, I think when we spoke, we would have probably been maybe about 20,000 subs on YouTube and we're now on 217, yeah, 218,000 subs. Yeah, so we've 10X'd it. I haven't 10 x my plays like because the audio plays are always just going to be, like sometimes they get a bit steeper and sometimes they get a bit more horizontal, but 
you don't get this absurd growth. It just doesn't happen because there's no virality on there. Um, but you can use YouTube as the front end of the funnel and be like, look, if you enjoy this, you can listen to it instead. There's also, I've also sort of done something it, it's because of the workflow, but it also works quite nicely in terms of driving people to the audio platforms that um, the audio episode goes up 10 hours before the video episode. So if you're subscribed on audio, you get essentially you get early access mm. to the podcast. So the podcast goes out at 6 a.m. and the YouTube version goes out at 4 p.m. Mm. UK time, um, which I, I don't know whether any or many of the audience have realized that, but... We get a lot of plays first thing in the morning, presumably people driving to work, stuff like that. Um, Timestamps has been something that people have requested. I don't use them personally as a YouTube viewer, but I've had lots of people thank me for putting them on. So yeah, like, I guess that's a thing. It's become like, yeah, standard practice. Like people just expect them now. And if they're not there, it's kind of like, why are they not there? It, it does take, if especially if you're a solo operation, I've, it's, you know, it's quite a bit of extra time. Yeah. Wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Without Ben, it wouldn't have happened, man. Yeah. And um, the other thing I just want to touch on is your Three Minute Monday newsletter. So you kind of got your personal thoughts and reflections on the previous week, the things you've learned, life hacks, updates about the podcast. Uh, it's a really good newsletter. Um, I think interesting to see, you know, what's coming up for you week over week. But in our experience dealing with podcasters, not everyone sees the value in creating a newsletter. So why should podcasters care about their mailing list? Um and, you know, what can they do to grow it? I haven't necessarily built the newsletter as a part of the podcast. It's more, I guess, a part of the personal brand infrastructure. Um, the main reason that you want a newsletter is that it's the only um, social access to your audience. It's the only audience that you own. Like, it's literally the only audience that you own. You don't need Facebook to mediate or YouTube or Twitter or even parlor or gab or you know some decentralized blockchain bullshit like you don't need any of this stuff to get in the way it's you have their email address and you can go from convert kit to mailchimp to substack to whatever you want you can move them around the internet as you wish uh, and it's a direct access so i wanted to start it up just because i thought everyone that i know that i really value their opinion in this world of content creation says that you need an email list mm -hmm. uh, so I started one and I actually really enjoy writing the email now. I can get it done in about 90 minutes to two hours every week. And it really helps me to sort of synthesize. It's like an end of the week summary and it's a useful exercise for me to test my thinking. It's pushing me to become a better writer. And um, when you need stuff, when, when stuff happens, like if, for instance, Apple Podcasts updated their, I'm sure that you guys are aware they updated mm. their app. And it turned out that my show was displaying episodes oldest to newest. Oh. If you were already subscribed. Yeah. So I was like, I sent out an email to everyone saying, look, this is how you fix it. And that was just the sort of the start of the weekly, the Monday, three minute Monday newsletter. It was like, look, go on, see if it's this. And if it is this on my birthday this year, I said, look, like it's my birthday. If you want to get me a present, give me five stars on Apple podcasts. And we got like a hundred, a hundred extra ratings, which is like, it's just a, it's just a play around thing. It's fine. Um, and as that grows, it'll grow. So I think you need to pick your battles. Like for instance, if you, if the choice is between publishing your podcast on YouTube and starting a newsletter, like put your podcast on, on YouTube, but find where the priorities lie within all of this. Um, and then yeah, just start, create a good lead magnet, you know, something good, my new one that comes out, that will be out actually by now. If you go to chriswillex.com slash books, it's a modern wisdom reading list. So a hundred books that you should read before you die. And that's the new uh, lead magnet to sort of get people to give me their email address, but it's really high value. It's 10,000 words. It's 60 pages. It's beautifully designed. It's got all books in that no one's going to have heard of and some that they will have done. And um, people don't mind giving you their email address if you're going to give them something really valuable in return. And then, yeah, if Apple decides to turn the app upside down again or, you know, lo Lord fucking hope it doesn't happen that my YouTube channel gets deleted or some other catastrophe occurs, yeah. I, I, I always have at least a, a backup of a direct access to the audience. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it is really important. And I think like 
the, the effort and the time and attention that you obviously put into creating a good lead magnet is is important. Like if you just throw together something like, and yeah, you can give your lead magnet a title, which can like almost guarantee people will download it. But then if they receive it and it's like, this was cobbled together last minute, it's just like, this leaves a bad taste in people's mouth. And they're like, yeah, why should I listen to, why should I keep engaging with this newsletter? So it is worth. Dude, that's, yeah. that's a really good point that no one ever thinks about. Like, because that's, what happens when you only optimize for the metrics but you don't actually understand how it's interpreted mm. so it's called goodhart's law um and basically when you when you optimize too much for the outcome that you're looking for it ceases to be a good outcome anymore and um yeah i mean for instance everybody has had a few drinks too many and perhaps woken up with someone that in the morning they regret uh how they spent their last 12 hours and that proves that you can do something in the moment that you regret in the future. And the same thing can occur with lead magnets. Never thought I was going <laughs> to draw a line yeah. between one night stands and lead magnets, but you here go. we are. Um, yeah, you can do that. You can get someone to click, you can clickbait your way to how to make a million in three days flat and they open it and it's just a blank piece of paper. Like that could happen. Yeah, That's an extreme example, but they would, yeah, you've got their email address. Now what? They hate you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything else is just a gradation between that and my magnificent 100 books to read before you die reading list yeah well i'm looking forward to that when it comes out um just to kind of close up uh i just wanted you to to tell us a story about the the jordan peterson interview and you know how, how that went were you anxious beforehand how did you approach it like obviously there's a certain amount of pressure on you like i got jordan peterson i need to make sure that this is a good one and i can get the most value i can out of this interview so yeah what what was the story there yeah, so that was a that was a fun one. Like I, I knew that Jordan had a new book coming out, and I thought, right, th this is the this is the chance. I've been working with Pen Penguin Random House quite closely for a while now, and I um I really wanted to get him on. I knew that he wasn't going to have a huge amount of press time. Finally booked him in, which was great. That was a, that was like a, a really sick email to get, uh, and then it got pushed back by. They tried to push it back by six weeks because his schedule was so busy. And I was like, look, like this this uh, six weeks is too much because i'm going to be right slap bang in the middle of this media tour he's going to have said all the interesting stuff he's going to say like is there any other dates that we can find and sure enough they found this one and it happened to be the day after the red skull fiasco with tanahasi coates mm -hmm. so marvel put jordan peterson into a, a captain america comic uh and it was like a bit disparaging and i got him the day after and it was the first thing that i talked about and that clip did one and a half mil Ooh. like in a weekend so and actually, oh, here's something, man. Here's something I've totally forgotten about. This is such a good a good hack, especially if you've got a great guest on. Um, what I've taken to doing is, let's say that you record, uh, let's say you're going to release an episode on a Monday and you've got a week's lead time between the two. I've actually taken to releasing a clip on the Friday before the Monday. So the, the full episode isn't available, mm -hmm. but here's a clip uh -huh. from the episode. And what that, my theory, my bro science theory is that that primes the algorithm because people that like that person will have seen that video. If they've watched it, they are more likely to be delivered the next video, which you know is going to be that person. Uh, yeah. Plus, it's also just, it's a short form piece of, uh, of sort of teaser content where someone's like, the number of people that commented and said, where's the full episode? Where's the full episode? Let's not forget that some people get pissy about the fact that if a full episode's out and you release a clip, they say, I can't believe that you're just re like republishing stuff that I've already seen. You're like, right, okay, so you're not happy if I publish a clip before the episode, but you're also not happy if I publish a clip after the episode. Those are the people that are just never happy. Yeah. But that's such a good hack. Like if you get a good guest and you've got like a bang piece of content that you know is going to go well, don't wait until the, the episode goes out. Put that out beforehand, sort of wet the whistle, so to speak, yeah. and then... Um, and, and, and get ready for the full the full one and that worked really well for us yeah with that um but yeah man it was you, again like hi jordan i'm sorry i'm recording on skype yes i'm aware that it's like ancient technology um he's got a, a dude that comes on eric who i know that's his like uh, producer guy that makes sure everything's sorted i was a bit nervous before speaking to him because i've spent a lot of time consuming his content and it, it does feel very much like a sort of a like a world cup final mm, type thing mm. like a pinnacle event so i was fine up until about an hour before and then a little bit of nerves kicked in so i was like right well i'll go 
I'll go for a walk. Didn't go away. I was like, right, I'll do some press ups. Didn't go away. Right, I'll do some box breathing. Didn't go away. I was like, oh, it looks <laughs> like I'm just going to be nervous then. I like, couldn't couldn't get rid of it. Um, I'd done like the right amount of prep. Like the amount of preparation I'd done was like bang on. Enough questions, enough freedom. Um, and then yeah, he uh, <laughs> he came on and. I think that he must have walk-in wardrobes behind where his recording setup is. I think that's his office, but he also must have some some wardrobes or whatever. So he's like walking about and uh, putting his jacket, like looking at different jackets that he's going to wear or something like that. And he's like, so what do you want to talk about today? <laughs> like turns around and asks what I'm going to chat about. And I was like, I'm just watching. It was so, it was <laughs> such an odd thing to do to see someone that gives lectures, like choosing the jacket that they were going to do, they were going to wear in this episode. Like it was such an odd, like, normal dad thing but anyway so <laughs> had a good chat with him and then yeah man the episode went went great again with that like look here's a really easy question what's your thoughts on this red skull situation like tell me six minutes just let him go hmm. okay something else let him go something else let him go um he's quite a difficult person to podcast with because his speaking cadence is a little bit sort of discordant mm -hmm. so he he talks pauses for one and a half beats and then talks again mm -hmm. So you need to, again, this silence thing was really important with that. Like I was just like, right, okay, just like give him one and a half times as much space as you think that you're supposed to give him. Um, and it ended up being like really good. I think people, uh, Michaela, his daughter said it's the best interview she's ever seen with a dad, which is very kind of her to say. Uh, and then for the next week, he went on other people's shows and talked about me, which was like, quite bizarre so he went on ben shapiro's sunday special and just unprompted in the middle of the episode started talking about me for two minutes which was like very Amazing. nice to hear and yeah it feels like leveling up like it, it genuinely does but I'm, I'm even at the time you start to think to yourself like i can't wait until the day that this happens and it's not a big deal like that's the level that i want to get yeah. myself to where you're like yeah yeah jordan brought me up or malice brought me up michael malice brought me up on uh, lex friedman's 200th or one 100th or 200th episode the other day and uh like i've just I, i'm looking forward to the day where i'm just like yeah 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 like and just another of course he did so yeah 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 exactly that's that's what it is but no it was cool man it was it was um i learned a lot from the the discomfort and the nerves and the and then the conversation and then we had a beautiful chat afterward where he was very complimentary about about my style and and stuff like that so yeah it was um yeah it was meant a lot it, it was great to see and uh, i was really i was i was happy for you because i knew like jordan peterson was someone that you, you were aiming for and that you know you you took a lot from his work so i was really happy to see that um i'm mindful of your time now chris so i'm going to wrap it up there but where should people go to connect with you and find out more about all the things you're involved in i mean we've mentioned some of them already but anywhere you'd like to send people just Modern Wisdom, wherever you listen, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Chris Williamson on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, at Chris Willex. And then if you want to get this brand new beautiful lead magnet that I've just made, chriswillex.com slash books. It's 100 books that you should read before you die. You can download it for free. It's got descriptions. They're all grouped, fiction, nonfiction, real life stories, everything. Like it's it's an awesome resource. So yeah, you should go and get that. And um, yeah just tune in there's 360 episodes for you to go back through so nice nice find one of them that you enjoy yeah, it's quality lead magnet as well um don't forget lead magnets are just the same as one night stands so that's the most important lesson that i've taken that's away the from main this. lesson that we've that we've learned today yeah, exactly but yeah it's been great chatting chris as i said i'm a big fan of your work really looking forward to seeing you know what the future holds for modern wisdom so thanks again brother my pleasure that's it for this episode. Thank you for taking the time to tune in. If you enjoy the conversation or find it useful, please do hit the like and subscribe buttons. Look, it only takes a couple of seconds for you to do, but it really does make a huge difference to myself and to Ben, who's done a great job behind the scenes on all the recording, editing, and post-production work on this series. If there are any podcasters you'd like to see in the next season or topics you'd like us to cover in the future, the best place to leave us that feedback is in the YouTube comments section. Alternatively, you can leave the show a rating and review on Apple Podcasts if you're listening rather than watching. That helps us keep the algorithmic overlords of the audio world happy. Lastly, if it feels right to you, please do tell the other podcasters or aspiring podcasters in your life about the show, as that's still one of the best ways we have to reach the right people with this content. That's it for me. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you next time.